Hello there, I'm Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now, if you've ever heard terms like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, I'm sure you've also heard the term blockchain. Now, blockchain technology is something we're going to hear more and more about over the next few years. So what is a blockchain? How does it work? And what does it mean to people like you and me? Well, let me explain. Put most simply, a blockchain is a list of transactions that is distributed publicly so that they can be verified and a level of trust can be created that those transactions actually occurred. Now, the reason why it's called a blockchain is because it is a series of blocks of data and inside those blocks are transactions and they are chained together. And it's the chaining of them together that gives the strength of blockchain. Now, before we go on more about how they're chained together, let's talk about a thing called hashing. Now, hashing is a technology that you find in computers from, from way, way back. Now, basically, there are two types of hashes in computer science. You've basically got a non-unique hash and a unique hash. Now, a unique hash is really, really interesting. What it basically means is whatever data you give the hashing function, the hashing algorithm, this little machine that creates the hash, whatever data you give it, the hash that comes out will be guaranteed unique. Now, that's quite amazing because it means if you give it a string or you give it a photo, or you give it a video file, or you give it transactions, then it will say this hash is unique and you can compare two hashes very, very quickly, and if they're the same, you know that the transactions are talking about the same block of data, you're talking about the same transactions. And if they're different, then you know they're not the same. So you might have, let's say, you know, a gigabyte of data, and then you get a hash. You might have another gigabyte of data that gives you the hash. Now, rather than trying to compare every single byte in that file, if you look at the hashes, you can say, oh, Okay, these are the same, these are not the same. So passing the hashes around, storing the hashes, using the hashes for computations is much, much faster than dealing with the actual data itself. Now, the key about hashes is uh, that they have to produce a different, unique answer, even if one little bit of that data is different. So if you have a sentence, okay, and then the sentence changes even by one character, then the hash has to be very different. Now, in the blockchain, what happens is that there is a particular type of hash, which is called SHA-256, which belongs to the secure hashing algorithm family of hashes. And SHA-1 used to be the darling of the internet. There are some weaknesses in it now where you can maybe find paths where the same data, different data, sorry, can give you the same hash. So now they've moved over to SHA-256, which is a form of the SHA-2 uh, a hash and basically what happens is is that when you have a block of data you produce a hash for that block you say here's a block give me the hash for that and that hash is unique and then what you do is you embed that hash in the next block so when along comes the next block of translations uh, transactions and inside that block is actually the hash for the one before it and then comes on the next block of transactions and inside that block is the hash for the one before it now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means it produces a chain because you can jump from one block to the next block to the next block to the next block by following the hashes. But also what it means is that if you want to change a block, so remember, even if we just change one bit, let's say I want to change it to say he sent two Bitcoins rather than one Bitcoin, okay? By changing that, it changes the hash, which means when you look at the next transaction and it says, well, the hash of the block before was this, and when it looks at the block before, it goes, no, it's not, it's different, it's changed. And so what that means is that to actually change any one block inside of the blockchain, you have to change the whole chain. So to change one even from a two to a one inside that transaction, you have to change the whole chain. Now, of course, the thing about hashes is they're not that difficult to calculate. In fact, on a, on a Raspberry Pi, you know, which is a tiny, tiny little single core computer, it calculates one hash in just a fraction of a second. So what you actually need to do is you need to make it harder to generate that hash. Because otherwise, even if you had a million blocks, recoding them wouldn't take very long for a modern computer very long at all. And you can say, no, here's the real blockchain. And actually it's got fraudulent blocks in it that you have manufactured yourself. And then the whole system of trust and of transactions and of financial transactions just completely falls apart. So when you look at these hashes, as uh, I've shown you, they, this big long sequence of numbers you can actually say, well, can I have a hash that starts with two zeros, please? Now, when I did this on my Raspberry Pi, it does take it a bit longer to generate a hash with two zeros on it. Now, hold on a second. How can it generate one with two zeros if 
the hash is always unique for a particular set of data. But what you do is you add on the end of the data uh, this thing called announce. Uh, and what that is, is basically you start a counter, one, two, three, and you add it onto the end of the string, or the end of the data, and you keep changing it, you keep turning it around until the hash that you get out follows a particular format. Now, even on my Raspberry Pi, I could actually generate one with sort of three, four, five leading zeros in just a, a few seconds. So what you have to do on the Bitcoin is actually want one that takes 17 uh, zeros to get it going, which means it takes minutes of, of high powered computing time to generate that hash, to have a hash that's got 17 zeros at the beginning, that's of today in 2017, and then, and then the data for the transactions. And what that means, if you wanted to recode the entire block now for a fraudulent transaction, then now you have to do kind of 10 minutes of work for absolutely every single block in the chain. And of course, if the chain is thousands and thousands along, well, that's a lot of minutes, okay, just to generate one fraudulent transaction, and therefore it becomes computingly infeasible to do that. Now, we've talked about blockchains because they're to do with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, and the idea is a transaction is sent out there on the internet. And the second important thing is that it is what they call distributed. It's using a peer-to-peer -peer network, which means there isn't a centralized server owned by you know, a US financial institution or owned by a UK financial institution or owned by Visa or MasterCard. It's transmitted to everybody that's part of the Bitcoin network, which means that there are thousands and thousands of copies of the chain or fragments of the chain throughout the entire world. And that means that if a part of the internet becomes unavailable, if a server is unavailable, if a particular institution is unavailable, the, the transactions can still keep going on, they can still be verified, they can still, there's still a level of trust because it's now distributed. So this is a decentralized view of doing financial transactions, very different to what we have today where the banks are the centralized um, authority and trust source for doing uh, transactions. Now, of course, blockchains are much more than just what can be done with Bitcoin. It can be applied to anything where there is a list of transactions. For example, maybe in many, most countries, I assume the land registry is a public record. If you want to find out who owns a piece of land, you might go to the right office, you might fill out the right form, you submit it, and then it comes back maybe days, weeks later, this is the person that owns this piece of land. Very important when you're buying property or when you're buying land, of course. Now, imagine a world where the land registry was in a blockchain. So it's out there, it's distributed, it's across anywhere across the uh, internet. And when you want to verify who owns a particular piece of land, what the last transaction was on a piece of land, then of course you just look at the blockchain and it tells you and you know it's secure and you know it's been verified because of that blockchain technology. Now that would be a great way of having public records available for anybody to verify and check uh, that the transactions are as uh, they say. But there is a downside to blockchain technology because those transactions that are put onto the blockchain need to be verified themselves. And the way you do that is using private public key cryptography. Now I've got two videos on one on cryptography in general and one on public key cryptography. And I suggest you both, you go and watch those if you're interested in this kind of thing. I'll leave the links in the description here below. And basically with public key cryptography, I'm able to sign a transaction as the private party. I then broadcast that out and then using the public part of my key, it can be verified that I did in fact sign that transaction, I'm agreeing with that transaction, and that it is a valid transaction. When the keys don't match up in this private public setup, then you say, well, hold on, this is a false transaction. Now, the problem is, is that if you ever lose your private key, you lose everything. So for example, if I had a disaster in my house, let's say there was a flood, and all my documents got destroyed, even my land registry documents, okay, I can still get a new driving license, I can get a new passport, I can get copies of my birth certificate, I can go back to the land registry and I can get again a copy of those documents to prove that it's me that owns a particular piece of land. But if I lose my private key, that's it, it's gone. I've got no way at that point to prove that actually I am the owner of that land. And this is what happens in the Bitcoin world. When people lose their private key, they lose their wallet, then of course they can't get those Bitcoins back. They are gone forever because the key is no longer available. Now that's a real weakness 
because at the level of we are all used to living in terms of you know identification and how we process things and and when we lose our keys it's it's a pain but it's not the end of the world if you lose a key for something like land registry or for bitcoins or who owns a house or your medical records or or anything like that then now we're in real trouble because everything is focused on that one point of weakness and that is a problem with the blockchain now there are lots of companies out there that are developing blockchain technology as a general technology and I'm sure we're going to see more and more of it and I hope this video has kind of given you an overview of how it works and how that level of trust in the transactions is developed inside of the blockchain. Well, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Android Authority YouTube channel, hit that bell notification, and also go over to androidauthority.com because we are your source for all things Android.